Rising up from the deep Pacific Ocean floor, an undersea mountain range thrusts its topmost peaks out of the sea to form the archipelago of Japan. The Japanese often refer to their homeland as Shimaguni, the island country. It's an appropriate name, for this nation is comprised of literally hundreds of small islands scattered among four larger islands. In total area, Japan is smaller than California. And yet this island empire has a population nearly equal to that of the entire continent of South America. The terrain of Japan is so rugged that less than one-fifth of the land is fit for cultivation. However, if Japan is short on land, she's long on coastline. And in the seas around them, the Japanese find resources to compensate for their lack of agricultural products. Supplying the nation's demand for fish, and ever more fish, requires an army of fishermen. In hundreds of seacoast villages throughout the islands, they make their homes. Ours is the story of one such village, and a typical day in the lives of those who harvest the bounty of the sea. The homes of these fisher folk usually consist of one main room, which also serves as bedroom. The stirring of the youngest child has the mother up with the first rays of the morning sun. Fortunately, the baby is a dependable alarm clock, for those who rest a living from the sea must take advantage of every hour of daylight. Breakfast is the first order of business. Although meals are cooked in primitive fashion over an open fire, the kitchen is immaculate. Soon a pot of rice is steaming over the flickering flames. The aroma arouses the entire family to an awareness that another day has begun. First daughter, Yokiko, is by profession an ama, or diving girl. Although she'll spend most of the day in the water, she neglects no opportunity to look her prettiest. Head of the house is the father, Sato-san, who skippers a fishing vessel. Not as concerned with personal appearances, first son and second daughter perform routine morning chores. A bowl of plain boiled rice will suffice to start them out on the long day's work. With breakfast over, father and daughter are off together to harbor and beach or each has an occupation dependent upon the sea. Sato-san's boat plies the waters far offshore in quest of fish that feed in deep and distant areas. His vessel is one of the first out of the harbor in the early morning hours, or often it's the early boat that catches the fish. While sailors ply the sea for fish, others comb the beaches for every morsel of food the sea will provide. In a Japanese fishing village, cooperation is the key to success. For every man who goes to sea, many more engage in preparation for the day's fishing.
Successful fishing demands that nets be camouflaged. Often the waters are stained by seaweed, so some nets are dyed somber brown and red. Deep waters are of indigo hue. For such fishing, bright blue nets are used. The fragile nets take a severe pounding from the sea, so they're constantly in need of repair. Net mending is everybody's business, although everybody's business is not necessarily net mending. To keep pace with increasing demands for fish, new craft are constantly in the making. Launching a new ship is a gala occasion for owner, captain, and crew. Yet despite high spirits and gay bunting, the event is so commonplace that it goes unnoticed by the rest of the villagers. At best, fishing is an uncertain business, but a community food locker assures a supply of fish during slack times. Since no cold storage facilities are available, fish are kept alive in wicker baskets. If regular deposits have been made, those with insufficient food can arrange for a short-term loan at the Fish National Bank. Unlike fish that must be eaten fresh, squid can be cured for future use. The Japanese consider squid a rare delicacy. And while it has the consistency of rubber, it does have a distinctive flavor, something like well-aged leather. While the most important yield of the sea is fish, the Alma girls are concerned with a different kind of marine crop. With the sun still low in the morning sky, groups of these diving girls gather in a secluded cove which serves as their headquarters. are girls of superior stamina and exceptional physique. They take to the sea early, and by the age of 15, many are experienced divers. Launching the boat directly into the surf is no easy matter, yet cooperating as a team, the girls manage the tricky task. The Amas ply their hazardous trade in quest of a variety of seaweed called heaven grass. Rich in iodine and other minerals, it's an important supplement to the nation's diet. The choicest grasses sometimes lie under 30 to 60 feet of water. And although the work is exhausting and strenuous, Many Amas pursue their occupation far past middle age. While most Amas work in groups, some are in partnership with a small boat owner with whom they share the profits. One very rare type of weed grows in rough water amid jagged rocks. Some Amas are willing to take the added risk, for it brings a higher price. Often a girl must stay underwater a full minute, seeking out the tiny handful of seaweed, which is eventually added to the supply in the net. After each dive, the float offers a buoyant support for a short rest. Fire aboard the boat is no cause for alarm. Set in a box of damp sand, the fire is kept contained and the boatman kept warm. No such comforts for the armor girl whose search continues among jagged rocks in icy waters. 
It's said that women are better able than men to stay in the bone-chilling work, though it's likely that a man made up the say. Since it is such cold work for the girl, the boatman decides to fortify himself with a hot cup of tea. But such luxury is not for the boatman alone. The girl, too, must occasionally come aboard to rest and warm her chilled body. Cloth thimbles protect her fingers from the sharp rocks. The respite affords an opportunity to remove them and restore circulation to numbed fingertips. However, her breather is of short duration. Soon she's back in the water. For an armor can afford little time out if she's to make her job pay. Those who remain ashore are kept constantly busy in support of those who go to sea. Washing a kimono presents a peculiar problem, for it must be completely unstitched before it's laundered. This means additional labor for the housewife, who also has the care of small children to think of. But the problem of babysitting has been effectively solved. The baby does its own sitting on mother's back. Out of sight, but not out of mind. Thus, small Japanese children seldom get lost, and they're bound to stay out of mischief. The most convenient laundromat is the nearest freshwater stream, where the women of the village exchange news and gossip and also wash out a few things. In Japan, washing windows takes no great pains. When paper panes get soiled or torn, the window is taken to the water. There, frayed panes are simply washed off. In many household chores, Japanese women use shortcuts that others might do well to note. Those who are with ironing board should use a nip-on ironing board. Clothes spread on panels soaking wet, dry wrinkle-free, no strain, no sweat. Only trouble with this labor saver is that the whole kimono must be stitched back together again. In this society of busy people, no one remains idle. For the children, there is school. Classes begin in the usual manner, but sooner or later, the importance of the sea creeps into the curriculum. Training in crafts that can be put to a practical use is most important. So the ways of ships must be thoroughly learned by those who will spend their lives in a continual challenge against the sea. Even artistic appreciation is strongly influenced by the environment of the fishing industry. So seascapes are a favorite theme. While the children may not become artists, all will grow up with a deep appreciation for the blessings of a life-giving sea. With lessons completed, the children are free for after-school play. In a seacoast village, this could mean only one thing. Sometime during the day, nearly everyone gets around to visiting the local department store. Here, the shop can get just about anything from pots and pans to a shave and a haircut. And no waiting either, for there's only one ahead of you in the barber chair. But the barber is a wide awake businessman, for he displays attractions to tempt tonsorial trade. In fact, there's everything here one might expect to find in a barber shop. 
from pinup girls to backroom loafers. In addition to shaves and haircuts, the barber performs all manner of tasks, from ear cleaning to minor surgery. But the job is completed with dispatch, for he has a customer waiting for a shave. A smooth shaven face is considered a mark of Nipponese beauty. Young ladies who haven't had it once over lightly lately are likely to be slightly out of style. The third style is to be smooth shaven from hairline to neckline, neglecting neither the eyebrows nor the eyelid. With a dainty pass of a powder puff, the beauty treatment is complete. The barber's best advertisement is a satisfied customer, but they're hard to come by when the haircut is on a catch-as-catch-can basis. Only women and children can afford daytime visits to the barber. Everyone else is busy with occupations connected with fishing. Those not engaged in catching fish perform duties in preparation for handling the catch. Wooden tubs are in constant demand. They'll be used for shipping fish to market and must be labeled as to contents and destination. Out at sea, Sato-san's drop lines are bringing in a steady catch of red snapper. These fish are taken on bait and hook. When the fish stop biting, fishing is finished. Fish provide the only source of income with which all other necessities must be purchased. Although luck has been especially good, the skipper's family takes only a small personal share. Even when the catch is in, the work is not over, for the boat must be kept ship-shape and ready for tomorrow. Today, the sea has given bounteously of its treasure, a substantial catch of red and black tie, a weight shipment to the larger cities of a hungry nation. As the day progresses, the tempo of activity at harbor and beach increases steadily. After a day of diving in icy waters, the Amas return to their headquarters. Beaching the boat is a critical maneuver. It must be turned at exactly the right moment between the swells and hauled onto the beach stern first, ready for tomorrow morning's launching. Exhausted, the girl's first thought is to change from wet diving shirts into dry, warm blouses. Later, the seaweed is carried to a central area for drying. After a period of curing, it's pounded and beaten to remove all impurities. After being bailed and weighed, 
seaweed is shipped to industrial centers for processing into a gelatinous commodity rich in food value. Toward day's end, return of the sardine fleet is expected, so a vigilant watchman keeps a sharp eye on his comic book with an occasional glance toward the horizon. When the first ship is spotted, a call goes out to man the beaches. All tasks are important, but the demands of fishing take precedence over all else. Everyone within earshot lays down his burden of the moment to answer the signal for help. is a total cooperative effort in which everyone has a personal stake and a community responsibility. Powered by a shore winch, the craft is hauled from the sea. Special wooden frames, greased and slippery, make for smoother sliding. As the hull is dragged over the skids, they're replaced again and again, until the boat is safely beached beyond the limit of the incoming tide. Hauling in drag nets is another labor requiring an army of industrious helpers. But since everyone's welfare depends upon a prosperous fishing industry, they all lay to with willing hands. common catch of the dragnet is the sardine. No matter how large the catch, the supply never equals the demand, for ton upon ton of these silvery tidbits are consumed daily in Japan. With the catch packed and shipped, boats lie at rest in the harbor. Only when all tasks are completed is there time for relaxation. But even in their entertainment, the subject of fishing is never forgotten. Fisherman's luck, good or bad, is symbolically portrayed in a stylized dance. As usual, the catch consists mostly of fish too small to keep. fishing can be tragic, these people can laugh at their own bad luck and, in typical fisherman fashion, enjoy the fantasy that fishing is always better on the other side of the stream. For pure relaxation, nothing can compare with the evening bath. The mother's bath is apparently a more private affair. When she gets it, no one knows. Her duties as back scrubber, housekeeper and cook occupy her every moment. Finally, it's time for the evening meal. Though Santa-san skippers the fishing boat, one small red snapper will be shared by all the family. The meal may not be lavish, but it is sufficient. And there's pleasant conversation. Like all fishermen, Santa-san is addicted to exaggerations about the size of the one that got away. And his age-old fish story meets with mixed reactions from the rest of the family.
With the meal over, Santa San has a chance to glance at the evening paper. The mother still has the day's washing to sprinkle and fold. But Santa San offers a willing assist in her pressing task. Soon the hours of darkness will give way to a new day. Tomorrow the struggle will begin anew. The eternal struggle to wrest a living from the sea. The bountiful sea that has forever been the life-giving garden of Japan.